So I just spent the last few hours on and off working on a replica of a flint napping tool in one of the books I have. It's a very interesting little tool and uh, I'll show you the reference. It's in a previous video but a lot of you guys didn't see the previous video probably on this particular tool. So I will show it completely in a minute here. Don't worry, I'll give you the, uh, the reference book and all that. All right, so this is a reproduction of a flint napping tool in one of the books I have by William A. Ritchie. The Archaeology of New York State, still a relevant book. It's from the 70s or something, 1980, last edition of it. It's a revised edition. Yeah, 1965, 69, and 1980. All right, so here, here we go. The reference is on page 185. It's this pressure flaker right here from the Meadowood phase. This is the dates of the Meadowood phase. Hold on. Okay, this is all BC. This is during the time of the Atlatl darts and not so much uh, as far as the bow and arrow goes, although it may have existed. It was not used commonly in this time period. Okay, so this is the scale for the real one. This is the scale for this sketch that attempts to uh, make some clarity out of this broken artifact, right? So what I did, this scale is off, right? So what I did is I made a full-size duplicate, but let's just see how much this is off. I finally have my calipers. All right, it's supposed to be three inches, but the actual dimension is three and an eighth. So this one is actually bigger than the real one. They tried to make it full-size or the exact size, but they didn't. All right, anyway, what I'm going to do, this is the actual full-size Okay, and in the original, the reason why I posted it is because the tips are made of copper. I made the tips and the working ends out of bone. Why did I make them out of bone? Because it was a lot faster. I can shape this a lot faster than I can shape copper. It still took me two or three hours on and off, whatever, this afternoon because I had to get it exact because I'm going to measure each and every piece so you guys have an exact reference. This is the reference I went by. You guys can screenshot it or whatever. These are all millimeters. Okay, I have squiggly line through there because I redrew it somewhere else with uh, US measurements. I just don't know where it is. <laughs> All I, all I have was this, these notes that I had thrown away, but then I found them, <clears throat> luckily before I threw it away, so then I had something to go by, <clears throat> so I didn't have to redo the whole thing. Okay, so what is this? This is elm, this is cow bone, cow bone, this is thread, in the reproduction it shows wrapping in the front, but you don't see wrapping in the front here. I don't think there was wrapping in the front. I think there definitely was wrapping in the back, and, and you can see some of it here in the drawing of the actual artifact. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a photograph of the actual broken and decayed artifact. 
So here it is, it's the duplicate exact size, full scale, full size, however, however you want to say it. Okay, and there's some interesting things about this that are not just the look of it itself is interesting. No, there's interesting aspects about how they made these. All right, so normally this would be sinew or some other permanent wrap or something that would stick because this will slide out. This taper here is not secure. All right, this would slide out. Now, if you're doing pressure flaking, it's going to be pushing inward, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you're carrying it and it bumps around in the bag or wherever you're carrying it, this will slide out if this is not glued on or secured with something sticky. It doesn't have to be extremely strong, just so it doesn't, the, this thread doesn't slide off, because it, it'll all slide off in the unit. If it's tapered like this, the whole thing will just slide right off. I, temporarily, I just put thread to simulate sinew. Okay, and now I'm going to remove the thread and I'm going to show you, I put score marks in here. I don't know if the original had score marks, but this is what I would do to prevent the slipping of the binding. I would just have it cut off straight, all right, it's a little bit here and a bit there. Two pieces, the original has copper copper uh, bits. This and that are both copper on the original. Mine are made of bone. So if you're just tuning in, I made these of bone because it was a lot easier and uh, less time consuming. And I can still use it if I want to with bone components. I will make one in the future, another one with copper. Okay, so what, what are the dimensions? What are the dimensions? What are the dimensions? All right, if I make a mistake, you guys hopefully can see the calipers, if they're in focus. All right, and you just go by the calipers. So the real one, the total length of just the wooden part, 73 millimeters. You can see right there, hopefully. Try to get everything ex as exact as possible at 73. Okay, which is two and seven eighths. I'm going to switch over to using English measurements. Two and seven eighths for the wooden part. The top part is a little shy of an inch. Okay, it's not perfect. It's supposed to be 25 millimeters. Uh, the exact measurement for an inch is 25.4 millimeters. Okay, so here it is. It's it's almost exactly an inch. All right, it varies because it, I wasn't perfectly uh, sanding it perfectly. Anyway, the other end is 15 millimeters or uh, nine sixteenths. Okay, this gap, there, there is no gap in the illustrations, but I, I'm going to assume that it's no larger than 3 sixteenths or 5 millimeter. Okay, I'm assuming that. The size of the hole, this one I don't have to assume. I took it off the drawing. Right? It's uh, very close to... What was that? Five sixteenths? Three sixteenths for this one. Yeah, and five sixteenths for this one. Now, if I keep dropping this or messing up, it's because I'm looking through the viewfinder to make sure you guys can see the measurements. And everything's in focus. All right? What else can I show you? It's, it's tapered, but it's tapered more than naturally tapered. Sticks are not tapered like this. 
this drastically. So this is an intentional taper of this degree. I don't have something to measure that angle. You know what I'm saying? This angle here, I don't have anything to measure it, but you can figure it out. Okay, the depth of the socket, uh, we don't have that. I'm just assuming that it's going to be uh, 1 16th more than a half inch, which is 9 sixteenths, or, you know, 14 millimeter, 14 and a half millimeter. Let's see, anything else? Just ask me in the comments if you can think of something else on this particular piece. What is this pattern? Uh, I think the original has it carved in, which is not hard to do because, as you can see, uh, this was done with a flake, these little score marks, which you can carve it in with a flake. I just did it quickly with a marker. Just a little design. And I don't think there's wraps around the top. I, don't, I think I mentioned that. I, I'm not going to put any wraps around the top of mine, but I am going to wrap the bottom part. Okay. So what are the bits? What are the measurements of the bits? Okay. The length of this bit, a little bit over an inch, inch and, I don't know, 3 30 seconds, a little over inch and 16th. All right, the width, it's going to be the same width as the item itself, you know, 15 millimeter or a little over, a little over 9 sixteenths, and just tapers down. Uh, you'll see why I made it look this way in a minute. This, you know, same diameter as a hole. 5 sixteenths, or this one's a little over 8 millimeter, 8.5 millimeter. Is it 8.5? No, it's 7.5. It's supposed to be 7.5. Yeah. Because in the drawing, I have it seven and a half millimeter. Okay. Now in the drawing, it looks like the the bit is a smaller distance than the full width. But I made the bit a full width because it didn't make any sense for it to be smaller. I don't think it was inserted into a, into a hole. I think it was socketed. And if you look at the original, it looks like it's uh, approaching the edges of that wood. Okay, up a little closer to the edges. Uh, and the wrapping is what makes it look more bulky. There's some decay, appears to be decayed, so I'm just going to probably take liberties and maybe it's not exact exact but I would wrap it with it matching the width of the wood exactly instead of having it be smaller okay uh, so and then the total length on this bit sixty six millimeter or two and uh, almost two and five eighths. The part that sticks out, I'm guessing on this part that's buried in the tool, the part that sticks out, according to the drawing, is 34, yeah, 34 millimeter. Yeah, that's 34. Okay, which is uh, 1 and 5 sixteenths sticking out. I made I made a guess on this part. That's how far I would drill it. Okay. So I'll just align it. Friction fit. I would just have a friction fit. And have it bottom out but not too tight so that I could remove it later when I replace it with another bit 
and I'd use elm or something that doesn't split easily and that's it okay now what's interesting is these two would be the only things left if this was copper and wood the wood deteriorates first and you're left with these little pieces okay now question is is this just a unique item only one in the entire world and someone was lucky enough to find it maybe but I don't think so why because I just recently picked up another book can't see it Pope William Communities in Illinois, Thorn Duell Edition, Scientific Papers, Volume 5, Illinois State Museum. All right. Hope, it's called Hope William Communities in Illinois. It was recommended to me. I like it. Copyright fit 1952. This is an old book, and I've already ruined it by looking at it so much. But, lo and behold, what do we find here? These were found together, as far as I know. Artifacts from the tomb in Mound WH something 4. Okay, artifacts from the tomb. These are all found together. Okay. Lo and behold, what? Lo and behold, what? Lo and behold, two copper items. These are the ones I'm interested in. Two copper items. Does it look like this? Yeah, kind of, sort of. Let's see. What are they? Don't go so slow, man. Hurry up. <laughs> I can just see it. I can just hear everybody. I'm trying to get this in focus. It's the problem. All right. Maybe you can read it. Maybe you can't. I'm looking through the viewfinder. So hold on. B miniature copper kelt. It's called a miniature copper kelt. C copper pin. All right. What are the dimensions? What are the dimensions? See if it's right. All right. Well, dimensions on this. I looked. This particular item here. It says it is ten inches long. So I went by this and made a scale. And came up with this one is 0.97 inches long this one is three inches long 3.05 inches so three and one so what was what was mine let's see Two and five eighths, not quite as long. And this is one which is a little bit tiny bit longer, right? Very comparable. Now, what would you want to do with a one inch long kelt? They say it's a miniature kelt. Really? It's a pressure flaking tip or a bit. That would be my guess. Why would you have a kelt so small? What is it good for? Now you can be chiseling little bitty things. Little bitty chiseling. Use a piece of copper for little bitty choppings. Maybe. It's possible. But this is a coincidence where you find the pin and the kelt. Okay. Coincidence? Maybe, maybe not. Let's look somewhere else. Is there another example? Okay, well, here we go. On this page, okay, let me give you the page on the other one since you'll be looking for five years because I didn't give you the page number. Page 186. It'll take you five years to find this page in this book if I don't give you the page number. Okay. In this particular case, I don't have measurements because I'm trying to do many things at once. I do have other things going on. So let me do that right now in real time. Figure out how long these things are in this, this particular page. 
Yeah, I haven't shown them yet. I know. I will show them in a minute. There's supposed to be flint napping tools in these pictures. Supposedly. Okay. Right here. It says. Above flint working tools and raw materials from the north east cache below the northwest cache in the tomb of mound wh something six page 205 so these are caches found together in tombs all right so they're calling them flint napping tools and what are these antler bone there's bones in here uh, and this particular setup here it describes it I uh, just messed up my pages these little loose pages all right anyway this is the page where we're, it, we're concerned about this one right here and I'm going to measure there's a these are copper items okay finally got around to saying it this is copper that's copper. I'm not going to go looking through these pages that I just dropped. But it says that the, those items are copper. This one and this one. Now, how long is this one? Let's see. Yeah, these are inch marks. These little tick marks are inches. One, two, three, four, five. Probably six inches for this one. This one down here, one, two, two inches for that one. Okay. If I were to make a, a full size of this kelp, it'd only be two inches long. Now, was it really stuck in an antler like that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it was found in a tomb, so probably stuck in an antler like that. Okay. What are those things? This might actually be a tool as a miniature kelt, but it's still only two inches long, which is that. A little more reasonable for a kelt, but I think it could also be used for a pressure flaking tool. All right, so there you go. There's three references where there's copper tools associated with flint napping. Okay. All three of them have pins. This particular thing has a pin of copper. And the other two sites, the other two graves, have copper pins accompanied by another piece of metal. Either it's a kelt or it's a, a little bitty end or another bit on the pressure flaker. Okay, so that's all. I think I covered what I wanted to cover. If I missed something, just ask me in the comments. I'll be making a duplicate, another one of these, with stone tools and with copper, with copper bits, not bone. I use bone because it would save time. Okay. Oh, let's see, what else? If you remember these from a previous video, split handles. I jammed a piece of wood in there to keep it open. Well, uh, it, these are drying out very well, right? So I don't need these anymore. They're not going to close up on me. They did split a little bit further. Especially this one. I could barely see the split when I put the wrapping on this. But now it's much further down. And I think this warped a little bit. I don't, I don't remember it being that curved. Okay, but it's time to remove the wrapping, I think. All right. Time to work on these. I can still make a knife handle out of this. Yep. So I'll do that probably on video. This one here. I don't know if I'm going to do anything with this one. In the time I have left, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a discussion on this, maybe. 
maybe throw out some ideas. Uh, I can carve. Yeah, I'll probably just carve this with stone tools on video. This is uh, elm bark, by the way. These are elm pieces of wood. Just the branch I cut up with a stone flake, I think. Big old stone flake or stone little improvised axe. Okay. How strong is this? Well, you'll see in a minute. How strong is this wrapping? It's, it's strong as long as you don't mess with it. I'll show you in a minute. It's strong as long as you have glue on it and you don't mess with it. But once you start messing with it, when it's dried out, it gets kind of crispy. Come on. And it'll break. Where's the, where's the end, of, end of it? Come on. Okay. All right, so is it strong? It looks strong. But if you start messing with it, it's very crispy, not very strong. Now it's strong in tension. Right now, right? Strong in tension. That's, that's still very strong. But if you mess with it, it starts to come apart. So like if it's a loop for a bowstring, and the bowstring, the bow is being shot several times, it just gets weak and it will snap. Not that good for bowstring. I don't recommend making bowstrings out of this stuff, although it can be done as an improvised bowstring. When it's still green, it'll be strong enough and flexible enough. But once it dries out, I don't recommend these for bowstrings. You got to make a new a new one every time you want to use the bow, if you make it out of this stuff. Sinew lasts a long time, so that's why I used to make the bowstrings out of sinew. You don't have to worry about it being crispy when it's dry; it stays flexible. It's all protein. It's not like cellulose, like the plants. Okay, so I think that's it. I'm thinking of what else I could discuss here. I'm not going to do any chopping in this video. I did, ah, uh, yeah, I did secure a seasoned piece of elm. It's going to be a real, real hassle to uh, split. I'm going to be splitting it with stone tools. Right now I'm trying to devise a good system for splitting with the stone wedges I have so that the wedges don't break because I have, I have had issues with the tips of the wedges breaking. And the backs of the where I hit the wedge on the back chipping so I'm, I'm coming up with some sort of device to hold the wedges in the right position so they don't rock like this or they don't catch the sides of the split and snap little little pieces off the edge that sort of thing and being able to hit the wedges extremely hard I've got a solid elm uh, mallet now I'll show it later all right, so that's it. That's it for now. What did I do? Yeah, I'm already going to lose my little... My little Celt-looking piece for this. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Where is it? Yeah, I probably lost it already. I don't see it anywhere unless it's in my shoe or something. Oh, here it is. Okay. All right. I did enjoy making this, although I was interrupted about 80,000 times.
Where is it? There's the mark. There it is. Beautiful. Okay.